to get in and also to make sure money for food because we're not paying for you and if you would like to go please contact miss melissa march to get your permission slip janae there's something i've been meaning to ask you will you marry me no no well that's awkward but there is somebody who did say yes to a marriage proposal and that's Kimmy McDonald, and we want to celebrate her on February 19th right here at the church. So please, all you ladies, come out and let's celebrate this wonderful wedding that's going to be happening. Congratulations. <laughs> Sammy, 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 guess what? What? All right. In two years, I'll be a senior. So that way, I can go to the senior citizens meeting. The senior citizens meetings at this church? And eat good food. Yes. Yes. You do know that senior citizens doesn't mean a senior in high school. It doesn't. No. It means you have to be over 50. And if you are over 50 and would like to attend our senior citizens we would love to have you. We have them on the fourth Tuesday of every month. So if you're over 50 and not a senior in high school, then please come out. We would love to have you. <laughs> Our kids are going to be performing for us on Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before Easter. This year is April 9th. And we want all the kids involved. So little lambs all the way up to kids club. Any age, we would love to have you involved in this program. And they're going to be practicing on Wednesday nights. Praise the Lord. Let's go into worship this morning.
amen to that. Hallelujah. We do want to welcome our visitors as well this morning. We're so glad you decided to come to Lake City PH this morning. 
If you will, I want you to look around. If there's any visitors around you, a face you don't recognize, I want you to step out of your seat. Come on, let's cross the aisles. Let's find somebody you haven't shaken hands with yet this morning. And let's have a time of fellowship. Come on, take a moment, shake somebody's hand. We're so glad you're here at Lake City PH today.
this morning? Do you want to see the fire of God this morning? Come on, give him a shout. Hallelujah. Here we go, let's go to the throne, to the place where we belong, right into His arms. Here we go, let's go to the throne, to the place where we belong, right into His arms. Come on, here we go. complacency this morning, Lord. morning if you have a need you need a blessing God is more than able to meet that blessing but something happens whenever you begin to ask God for his spirit and for him and not to meet your financial need or your healing you say God if I just have you I'm good I just need you I don't always have to have blessings I don't need to drive the nicest car or have the nicest house but if I have you I'm gonna be all right can you say amen to that this morning Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, your word. Thank you, Jesus. Giving us new life. Thank you, Lord.
lost be found Like you mean it this morning. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Come on, He's given us new life. He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back.
Most of y'all know I grew up Baptist, so we're very traditional in a sense. We're by the book. Um, but this offering is an extension of the worship we just had. You know, God asked for our 10%, but really he's asking for all of it. He just wants us to manifest 10%. He wants us to, he wants us to show him that we understand where he's coming from. So as you tithe today, continue to worship. Um, just a little side thing. Kimmy McDonald's bridal shower today is from 3 to 5. Um, 3 to 5, that wasn't on the announcements. Um, kids will be having play practice tonight over at the gym, 7 o'clock, um, during worship time with the pastor. And then after I'm done praying, if um, all the kids will meet me over here at the door, and we'll be released. Um, if you're in Miss Laura and Miss Michelle's class on Wednesday nights, you need to stay in church. Um, and I'll take the ones that are in my class on Wednesdays with me. So let's pray and ask the blessing over these tithes. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you came as the, the weakest part of your creation, as a baby. And you grew up in the same circumstances we did, and you didn't falter once. You're blameless. You're sinless. You died for us, and you rose again, ascended, and you're coming again, Father God. And we just praise you for that. I ask that you bless these tithes that we give as just an extension of our praise and worship to you, to you, not just out of tradition, not just out of obligation, but as worship, Father God, that this little bit that we're giving to you actually will make an impact so monumental that we can't even grasp it. Um, you said that we have the faith to move mountains, and that may be this, this little mustard seed we're giving out has the ability to move mountains in somebody's life, Father God. And I ask that you... Just continue to bless this service um, and just um, bring clarity and peace of mind and speak through Pastor as he goes through his message today. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. All right, kids, you meet me at the door. Sorry, 6 o'clock, not 7. Thank you, Daniel. 6 o'clock tonight, play practice.
could not come to where he was. He came to me. Anybody that can testify of that? Has he ever come to you when you couldn't get to him? Has he ever come to you when you didn't deserve for him to come to you? Really, he shouldn't have come, but he came anyway. He really should have left you in your mess, but he came to you anyway. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Genesis this morning. Genesis chapter 1. Everyone please stand for the reading of God's Word. It is so good to see Brother Willie Enfinger in service with us this morning. Brother Willie had major, major surgery a few weeks ago. And um, he is a miracle that he's here. But they did a scan, and he is cancer-free. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise God. Glory to God. Sister Constance Burns, so good to see you. This I've, She'll be headed back to Washington, I suppose, but... We'd love to have you in living down here all the time, but she's from Washington, D.C. Amen. And we love you, and we're just glad to have you. And all of you here this morning, so good to see all of you 
in the house of the Lord today and just looking forward to what God has in store for us today. It is 1130, and I want you to put this in your mind. I want you to say this aloud. I, I will be in church, be in church. For, one for one more hour. So get that in your mind. So you're going to preach an hour, preacher? I might. But um, probably not. But I want you to put that in your mind because I want you to look and say, oh, oh, it's almost 12. You're not getting out at 12. You can go at 12 if you want to, but we're not letting out at 12. So just get that in your mind, and um, that way you'll be able to you'll, you'll be able to take you'll take the medicine better. It'll go down better that way. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue it. And have dominion over it. The fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air... And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for your consumption. It shall be for your use. It shall be for your meat. I've given all of this to you. I want you to tell your neighbor, God loves you. And he created this earth for you. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that the power and the person and the presence of the Holy Ghost of God would just take over me today. As I begin to teach the word of the Lord this morning, as I begin to expound it, as I begin to preach it, Lord, I pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to every person that is here. Lord, I thank you that I'm not rushed this morning. God, I'm not going to rush through. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to tell them what you told me to tell them. And Lord God, I believe that by the end of this message this morning, the Holy Spirit will have already spoken things that I could not speak. The Holy Spirit will have already inputted things that I could not put inside of them. And Lord, I believe that they are going to be a better people, a more holy people, crafted in the likeness and the image of God. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen and amen. I want to continue to talk to you about the blessed life, living a blessed life. And if I were to title this message this morning, which is what I'm doing, I would call it Learning to Bless. Learning to Bless. You will discover blessings when you learn to bless. The first thing I want to show you from our scripture this morning, though, is that God intended his people to live in blessings. God intended his people to live a blessed life. I want you to look at some of the words that he used here. He says, God, this, this is from the offset. This is the very first dealings of God with man. It's when God is dealing with man for the first time. And notice what he says. He says, I'm going to bless them. He says, I'm going to make them fruitful. He says, I'm going to cause them to multiply. I'm going to cause them to replenish. I'm going to cause them to subdue. I'm going to give them dominion. And then he talks about the fact that he has given us this earth. This earth belongs to us through God. One of the reasons why the left wing of this country that is so philosophically opposed to everything that the church is doing, to everything that the Bible says, what is their great, what is their greatest um, um, adventure? What is their greatest endeavor? It is to do what? It is to protect the earth. All of this environmental stuff. Let me tell you something. That is simply a, 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 um, a mask that the devil is wearing in order to get people to think that we are here to take care of this planet. Now, I'm not telling you we should pollute it. I'm not telling you that we should leave trash in the yard. I'm not telling you that we should pollute the skies or poison the waters. I'm not saying that. But I am telling you this. God did not create 
man for the earth. God created earth for man, and he put us here that we would enjoy this planet and that we would that we would um, be here for him. This earth was made for us, and we were made for him. Amen. Let me make sure you understand that again. This earth was made for me to enjoy. Not for me to have to worry every second of, of the day that I'm going to leave some carbon footprint behind. It was made for me to enjoy. He said, I created it so you could enjoy it. I created it so you could have dominion over it. I created it so you could subdue it. I created it so that you could eat the meat of it. I've given it to you, and I want you to be blessed. The only thing I ask in return is that you remember that you are created for this purpose. In him we live and move and have our very existence. The only thing I want you to remember is that I created you for my pleasure. I'm here on this earth to bring God pleasure would you worship him this morning hallelujah 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 so for the next weeks I want to talk to you about the keys to living in the blessings of God how many of you believe that God wants you blessed amen you know one of the um, greatest insults to classical Pentecostalism today is for someone to tell them that they are a prosperity preacher. And how many of you know that the prosperity preachers ha can run amok? How many of you know that? That's why I spent the first part of this message telling you that our blessings is not wrapped up in wealth. That our blessings is wrapped up in spirituality. That the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I want you to understand that. You can go to heaven poor. But you can't go to heaven sinful. You can go to heaven broke, but you can't go to heaven sinful. And so I want you to understand that the most important part of Christianity is not wealth and money, and we are to never equate those things to spirituality. But at the same time, I want you to understand that we serve a God that loves us and desires to bless us. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? Amen. So God wants us blessed. And he wants us blessed for many reasons. And the main reason, one of the main reasons is he wants us blessed so that he can prove that his principles work. He wants us blessed so he can prove that his principles work. Malachi chapter 3, I can already hear you say, ugh, ugh. You know, I don't know why people get so upset about this. This is one of the most exciting portions of Scripture in the Bible. One of the most exciting verse Scriptures in the Bible. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And then notice what he says. And prove me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a moderate blessing. That's not what he said. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Well, that's the kind of blessing I'm looking for. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know, we've shied away from tithing when it's literally one of the most exciting subjects in the Bible. It really is. The tithe is the only thing in the Bible that God ever said to prove him with. God never said, jump off of a building and I'll catch you. God never said, slit your wrist and I'll not let it bleed. God never said, run in front of a car and I won't let it hit you. God said, never take a gun and shoot yourself with it and you'll be okay. The only time he ever said to prove him, to put him to the test, is when it came to tithing. It is the only thing in the Bible that he ever says that we have the permission to stick him at his word, stick him at his word, and see if he'll do what he said he would do. He is telling us to tithe for what reason? 
because he wants to put his ability to provide on display. The reason why he wants to tithe, wants us to tithe is because he wants us to put his ability to provide on display. We should never look at God's blessings as a point of personal boasting. That's not why he blessed us. He didn't bless us so we could ride around and say, oh, look at this beautiful car. Look at this beautiful house. Do you know how much money my clothes cost? Let me tell you how much money I have. No, he didn't bless us so we could boast about how he's blessed us. He didn't bless us so we could put our, our wealth on display. He blessed us so people would look at us and say, how in the world do they make the same amount of money I make and drive that car? How in the world do they make the same amount of money I make and live in that house? How do they make the same amount of money I make and wear those clothes? How do they do it? And then on top of that, they go to church every Sunday, and somebody said that they give one-tenth of their income back to, to the church. How in the world are they doing what they are doing on that little bit? I said to my wife one day, uh, we were talking about our blessings, and I said, I honestly don't know how we do what we do with what we have. And she said to me, it is because we don't love money. Do you love money? You're never going to get ahead. Oh, you might have money, but you're never going to get ahead. You got to come to a place that you don't love money. You got to come to a place that you love God. And you realize that all the money belongs to him anyway. And he says, if you'll trust me with that, then I'll take care of you. I'll treat you better and do you better with nine tenths than you could with ten tenths. But you can't do it if you're greedy. You can't do it if you're, if you're motivated by greed rather than generosity. So you should never look at God's blessings as a, a point of boasting. God is a giver, and he loves to give to his children. You hear what I'm telling you? God is a giver, and he loves to give to his children. But let me tell you this. God also loves for his children to give. You see, we can shout all day about God being a giver and that he loves to give to his children, but he also loves for his children to give. For in their giving, they act like him. When they give, they're acting like God. And they also release his power of giving in their lives. Do you hear what I'm telling you? When you give, you are acting like God, but also you are releasing the power of God in your lives. Now, I know this isn't stuff that you're, you know, jumping and shouting and running the, the backs of the pews, and if we still had chandeliers sh um, swinging from, I understand that. But this is empowering you. If you will listen to what this preacher is saying this morning, this word will empower you. It will give you the ability to do things you could not do in yourself. God will do them for you. So he is a giver, and he loves for us to give. Just as God gives us permission to test him in the tithe, in the tithe, God restricts his power to bless us. Hear what I'm telling you? The only place in the Bible where he says, prove me, test me, is in what? The tithe. It is also the only place I know where he puts a restriction on himself. Hear what I'm telling you. How many of you have ever known God to heal somebody smoking? I have. I've known God to heal somebody that smoked and them continue to smoke. How many of you have ever known God to heal somebody drinking? I've known God to touch and heal somebody drinking and them continue to drink. <laughs> See, there is no restriction on healing. He'll heal the dirtiest, rottenest sinner in the house. There is no restriction on healing. There is no restriction on salvation. He'll save the dirtiest, rotten sinner in the house. How many of you have ever known somebody to get saved and go back to doing some bad things they shouldn't have done? There is no restriction on salvation. He'll heal. He'll save. He puts no restriction on any of his power except 
when it comes to tithing. He will not bless someone living in disobedience. He will not provide for someone who is robbing him. He will not allow his supernatural power to work to their financial benefit when they are in rebellion to him. It is the only area of the Bible that I know that he restricts himself in. And he does it. He puts the restriction on himself. Now I want to ask this question. What does a life filled with blessings look like? Hear what I'm telling you. What does a life filled with blessings look like? Now, this is simplistic, but I want you to get in your spirit. Being blessed means that you have supernatural power working for you. Being blessed means that you have supernatural power working for you. What does being cursed mean? If being blessed means I have supernatural power working for me, being cursed means I have supernatural power working against me. When I'm blessed, supernatural power is working on my side. But when I'm cursed, supernatural power is working against me. Is there anybody in this room that can testify that you have had supernatural power working in your benefit? Let me see your hand. You know there are times that God let the gas stay in the car. You know there are times that God stretched the dollar. You know there are times that somehow money appeared. Have you ever gone to your account and said, I didn't know I had that much money in my account? I, have, you ever, have you ever found a discrepancy in your account and said, I know there wasn't that much money in my account? Have you ever paid all your bills and at the end of paying them you say, my Lord, where did this come from? Has that ever happened? I remember when my brother Kelly um, got all of his graduation money and he wasn't even a Christian, didn't even claim to be a Christian in any way, shape, or form. But we were taught to tithe. And so he paid tithes on his graduation money, $200. He got $2,000, he gave $200 back in the work of the Lord. And I remember one day, he came to me, he said, Tim, he said, I opened up my drawer. He's not even a Christian. But he said, I opened up my drawer, and inside of my drawer were $100 bills that I did not even know about. I'm telling you, I didn't put them there. I don't know who put them there, except that God put them there. You may say, preacher, do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. I believe God can pull money out of the air. I believe God can put coins in a fish's mouth. I believe God can stretch and let a, let a few fish and a few loaves feed 20,000 people. What I'm telling you is, I know what it's like to be benefit from supernatural blessings. Look at me. I'm 44 years old. I grew up in a tithing family. My mom and dad taught me to tithe. I remember when I was a little kid and they wrote a tithe check out. And I said, Mama, what's that for? She said, that's our tithes. I said, what is that? She said, we, she said, we pay it every month. They, they owned a small business and every month they paid that tenth. That tenth went back into the kingdom of God. They taught me from a little boy to tithe. And when I worked as a little boy and I was stacking wood and I was hauling wood for my dad. Every Saturday we'd get out and we'd haul firewood. He paid me five dollars a load. Some Saturdays we'd haul 10, 15 loads of wood. But on Sunday I collected that amount of money and one tenth of it went back into the storehouse of the Lord. God taught me how to tie through my parents but I want to tell you this. He blessed me through my parents. All of my life, all of my life I've been blessed by the Lord. When I was a little boy, I watched God open up the cupboards of heaven and pull out the food for us to eat. I listened to my dad pray and seek the Lord. I enjoyed the blessings of the tithe when I was a little boy. But then when I grew up, I continued. I got to talk to Willie Enfinger yesterday for some time. and 
he was telling me that his mama taught him how to tithe. And he said, for years, he said, I did it out of routine. All of his life, he did. He said, I did it out of routine. He said, I now learned the joy of it. I've learned the joy of it. That's where I would love for you to get to is learning the joy of it. But if you can't learn the joy of it, at least learn the routine of it. So I enjoyed the benefit of tithe from off of my parents. Do your children enjoy the benefit of tithe? Do your children enjoy it? Do they understand the benefit of it? Are they reaping blessings? My uncle owns one of the largest auto collision shops in the state of Florida. It's worth multi-millions of dollars. His offices are in the house my mama grew up in. When my granddaddy owned it, it was a little tiny shop, one or two people. Now it's, I mean, it's just a sprawling piece of property. But the, the epicenter of that business is in the house my mama grew up in. My grandmother's picture sits right in the middle of it. And I thought about how my granddaddy gave her $15 a week to buy groceries. And she took one-tenth, $1.50 of that $15 a week. And every week she'd stick it in that little tithing envelope. He wouldn't let her tithe. No, he used his money to golf and hunt and fish and go to ball games, buy anything he wanted, buy any kind of gun he wanted. But he gave her $15 a week, and from out of that, she scooted that little $1.50. And when I look at that sprawling complex that my uncle now owns, and I see all of those employees and see all of that business, I don't credit it to his business genius, even though he's a smart man. I believe somewhere in the time, God was counting that dollar fifty. <laughs> God was setting that buck fifty to the side, and said, "From this little house, one day I'm gonna I'm gonna allow you to build a multi-million dollar business." You see, the power of the tithe cannot be calculated. You can no more count the power of the tithe as you can count the amount of apples in a seed. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The same way that you cannot count, you can count the seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the amount of apples in a seed. And that's the way the tithe is. That's the way the tithe is. Some of the tithe we use to live off of today, but some of it is put in reserve for generations to come. Do your children benefit from the power of the tithe? Think about, what, think about what pastor's telling you. Do your children benefit from the power of the tithe? How many of you know what it's like to have the supernatural power of God working for you? Let me see your hand one more time. How many of you ever had the supernatural power of God working against you? Right here. Right here. I have suffered lack in my life one time. One time. I should not have had it. I had a wonderful job, pastor in a wonderful church. I lived in the parsonage. They paid almost every imaginable bill that I had. Cell phone, home phone, electric bill, power bill, everything was paid. They paid me a wonderful salary to go along with that. I made money on the side. I preached on the side. I had, there's no reason that I should have been in lack at all. And I remember one day I went to go to Waffle House. I pulled up at the bank and stuck my card in the machine at the bank to pull out the money, and there wasn't even $20 in the bank. I didn't even, even, I didn't even have the money to buy a meal that night. It should have never happened. My conference superintendent called me a few days later and said, um, Tim said, are you not making any money? And I said, no, sir, they're, they're paying me. I had somebody that was in charge of my finances, was paying my bills, and come to find out that they had not paid tithes but four times in a year. They called me at the end of the year only four times. The person was angry at the conference, and so they were withholding the tithe. And I was living under the curse of God. And it was brought on by disobedience. Do you hear what I'm telling you? 
Well, why would God curse you? No, it's not God. It's you. It's you. God set the financial principle in order. He set it in order, and he said, if you tithe, I'll bless you, and if you don't tithe, I'll curse you. If you will be obedient to me, I will bless, and if you be disobedient to me, I will curse. If you will be obedient to me, I will prove to you that my supernatural benefits and blessings are working in your life. But if you be disobedient to me, you'll be like a man that has a money bag with holes in it. And no matter how much money you cram in it, it will never be full. You will never ever get ahead because I will not bless you. You may say, well, I'm doing pretty good without tithing. Try tithing and see how well you could do. Put God to the test. Prove me. Put my blessings on display. And I'll show you how great I am. I'll show you how powerful I am. Now I want to show you a couple of things that the tithe is for. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 27. By the way, Malachi 3 and 9 is what tells us. Before God tells us about the blessing, he told us about the curse. And it was in Malachi 3 and 9, he said, I will curse those who rob me. Now, Deuteronomy 14 and 27. And the Levite that was within thy gate, everybody say the pastor. Thou shalt not forsake him. Everybody say, don't forsake the pastor. For he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. And at the end of three years thou shalt bring what? How much? All the what? What is the tithe? Ten percent of thine increase. When you see the word tithe, understand that it holds within it a meaning. Somebody said, well, tithe means 10%. No, it's the first tenth. doesn't mean 10%. It's the first tenth. It is the first tenth. It's not just 10%. It is the first tenth. If I had 10 dimes laying here, and I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which is the tithe? The first one. So the tithe is the first tenth. He said, you shall bring all the first tenth of what? Of thine increase the same year and shall lay it up within thy gate and the Levite, everybody say the pastor, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gate shall come and shall eat and shall be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. Let me tell you something. I, I, know, I know I'm the pastor, and I, hate pre I, sh I should preach this to somebody else, but I'm preach to you. Um, I should be preaching it for another pastor because you're going to think I'm saying it because I want to tell you this. Never, ever, ever should you have the attitude, God, if you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. And never, ever should you have the attitude of, Man, we're just paying our preacher too much. They're just paying, they're paying him too much. Because your blessings flow through God blessing the clergy. Your blessings flow. I'm telling you, you can look at it all throughout the Word of God. The blessings of God are released when the man of God, when the, the shepherd of the house, when the one that God is, has given to tend the flock, when that person is being increased and blessed, it flows to the entire body of Christ. So... So if you get upset about the preacher being blessed, then you might as well know you are cutting the blessing flow off on your own. But let me tell you this. The first purpose of the tithe is to take care of who? Yeah, 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 okay. See there, they don't want to hear this. The first purpose of the tithe is to take care of the, the pastor. The, I'm, hey, I didn't write it. I didn't write it. The first purpose of the tithe is to take care of the pastor. You take care of him first. Say, well, preacher, what about the power bill? You take care of him first. 
Well, preacher, what about the building payment? You take care of him first. Well, preacher, what about this? And this is what he's saying. If you take care of him first, I'll take care of the rest. You take care of him first, I'll take care of the rest. There are too many greedy, selfish, stingy churches that are more concerned about their building and more concerned about their power bill and more concerned about those things. This is not one of them, by the way. This is not one of them. But I'm, I'm preaching this maybe to somebody who's watching me by the Internet. Maybe some greedy board member right now is watching me by the Internet that thinks they're going to hold everything in a church savings account in order to build a building. You start taking care of that pastor and he'll build you a building. You start taking care of that pastor and he'll pave your parking lot. You start taking care of that pastor and he'll take care of those things that you're hoarding. And it ought to be in the heart of every church member to want to take care of their pastor. Amen. And then not only does he say the pastor, he also says you need to take care of the stranger. What does that mean? The person that just comes in from off the street. Preacher, there's just too many of them coming in off the street now. Just too many of them coming in. You ought to, why, 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 you don't, you really want to take care of them? That's what the tithe is for. That's what it's for. He said, you take one-tenth of what you have. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to let you sell more metal buildings. I'm going to let you build more things. I'm going I'm to put you over more contracts. I'm going to bless you. You take one-tenth of that and give it back to the church. Give it back to the church. I'm going to give you raises and bonuses, and I'm going to give you overtime. I'm going to take care of you on your job, and you're going to make more than you ever thought about making, but you take one-tenth that, give it back to the church. And then from that one-tenth, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to use it, first of all, to take care of the man of God. I'm going to use it, first of all, to take care of the clergy. I'm going to use it, first of all, to take care of those that feed you the Word of God. And then I'm going to make enough of it. There's going to be enough of it left over that I'm going to use it to take care of any any stranger, any widow, anyone that's fatherless. I'm going to take care of the poor. I'm going to take care of the needy. And notice what he says. He said, when you bring your tithe, they will all be satisfied. There is a mandate from God to the church to take care of the poor. There is a mandate from God to the church to take care of the needy. There is a mandate from God to the church to clothe the naked and feed the hungry. He said on that day, you will say, did I not cast out devils in your name? Did I not heal the sick in your name? Did I not preach the gospel in your name? And he said, I'll look at you and say, I never knew you. And he'll say, when I was sick, you did not visit me. When I was in prison, you did not come to me. When I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was naked, you did not clothe me and they will say Lord when were you in this condition and he will say when you do it to the least of these when you do it to the least of these you have done it unto me You see, we're just so concerned that we're going to get taken advantage of. We're just so concerned that we're going to feed somebody something that really doesn't need it. We're so concerned that we're going to help somebody that could have helped themselves, but because of their own laziness, they're in the shape they're in. And so we are so concerned that we're going to enable them to stay lazy and enable them to be where they are. And that carries more concern to us than the call of God to help people. It, concern, it, it, it is more concerning to us that the church not be taken advantage of than to do what Jesus said to do. I know, I know, I know this isn't popular. I know it's not. Did anybody here ever deserve to get saved? 
Did anybody here ever deserve anything God ever did for you? But he did it anyway. He did it anyway. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Amen. Did you hear what he said? He said, there's a bad spirit people have. They're concerned. They're concerned about, well, the preacher's making more than I make. You just do what God told you to do. That's all. Listen, all you have to do is do what God told you to do. And then it's up to the church to do what God's told them to do. Years ago, I went to um, preach in Gainesville, Florida. And my best friend, Jerry Jeter, went with me. It was before he started preaching. And he today pastors a great, great church and high leadership in, that, in his denomination. But before he started preaching, and, and he and I went to Gainesville. And I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night. And my grandfather and my uncle were preaching, or were fishing. They weren't preaching. Lord, they weren't preaching. Um, they were fishing at a lake called Lake Panasofki. And um, I can't remember. It was in the summertime. It was hot outside. But they kept earthworms. In that particular lake, they fished with earthworms. And so the cabin they were staying in had buckets of earthworms all around it. And... Um, they had to keep the cabin as cold as they possibly could get it in order to sustain the life of the earthworms. And it was cold. You could have hung meat in there. And so it was summertime, so we were not dressed for winter weather, but it was literally like winter inside of the cabin. And so we got there. Granddaddy and my Uncle Riesel were already asleep, and um, they were in beds in another room. And so um, we got there. We didn't want to disturb them. And they left a key for us. We came in, and there was a little couch that um, flipped like this. You know what I mean? Like, you, you know, sit in it, but it kind of like flipped, and then there was like an area in the middle that you could lay in. There was that, and there was a hard metal chair. That was the only furniture in the room. Jerry flips that little couch out, jumps on that couch, and takes the couch and leaves me with the hard metal chair. And it was cold, and Jerry is tiny. I mean, he's tiny. He's, he's nine months older than I am, and, and, um, and, and even to this day, I mean, he's like this big. He's a, he looks like a skeleton with skin pulled over it. He's that skinny. He is a tiny little guy. I talk about Mutt and Jeff, you know. And so Jerry jumps in, takes the only bed in the whole room, and he's freezing, of course. We're both freezing. It must be 50 degrees in that cabin. He's freezing. And he yanks the only cloth in the whole room, which was a towel, a little thin towel. And he has the towel wrapped around him, and he's laying on the only bed. And I'm sitting in a hard metal chair, cold, with no, no towel, no, no cover, just sitting there in this hard metal chair. And my granddaddy hears me, and he says, Tim? I said, yes, granddaddy. He said, come back here. He said, there's beds back here. And, um... You can come sleep with me. And so I went and got in the bed with my granddaddy, and it was warm. And, and so granddaddy says to me, he says, Tim, where's Jerry? I said, oh, he's in there. And he said, um, I said, he's sleeping on the couch. He said, well, there's some real warm covers up there in the closet. And I said, that's okay, granddaddy. He don't need anything. <laughs> he's already got something. Jerry said he was laying in the room, and he said when he heard Granddaddy say there's some warm blankets up there, he said, oh, he was so cold. He was freezing. I'm telling you, so cold nature. It's freezing to death. And, he, and then he heard me say, that's okay. He don't need anything. Well, I laid there for about three or four or five minutes, and I got to feeling sorry for him. And so I got up, and I went and got a warm blanket, and I went and handed him a warm blanket. Let me tell you, and I hope Jerry may be watching you didn't deserve that warm blanket. <laughs> you are going to leave me in the cold, sitting on a hard chair with nothing while you were all wrapped up in that little towel laying on that little couch thing. 
he didn't deserve my mercy, that he was my friend. And so I went and took care of him anyway, because he was my friend. I did not do it based off of his goodness. I did it because he was my friend. And furthermore, I could not have slept in that warm, comfortable bed all night knowing that he was freezing in the other room. In fact, even if he had not been my friend, in fact, even if he were a stranger just staying there, and I knew that he was cold in the next room, I could not have stayed in that warm bed, comfortable all night, knowing that another person, another human being, was suffering and I had the power to do something about it. This is the Spirit of Christ. The more of Christ's Spirit that lives in you, the more generous you will be. It, amaz it amazes me when I look through financial records and I see people that have attempted to tithe they have given a, a, a stipend of income. They have given a donation through the year of tithe. And then you look at other giving, and they've not given anything to the children's home. They've not given anything to world missions. They've not given anything to an evangelist. They've not given anything to any other special offering. Now, I mean, they could be pulling it out of their pocket. I understand that. But it amazes me the people that do just the bare minimum. Well, I, I, got, I got in what I was supposed to get in. Most likely, you probably didn't. Most likely, you probably didn't. Most likely, you have not given a full tenth of your income. Because I don't know that I've ever met anybody that was a tither that gave a full tenth of their income that did not give more. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that gave a true tenth of their income that also didn't support the children's home and world missions and evangelists. Because if you ever get a hold of what it means to give like God gave and to love like God loved and to have the Spirit of Christ inside of you, you can't give enough. And it so prompts him to give back that you always have it to give. You can't, you literally cannot outgive him. But it comes through a spirit of generosity. I watched something um, not long ago. I want to get Anna to play it. Anna, make sure it's turned up loud. Or Bryce, make sure it's turned up loud. I want them to hear this. This little clip I, I found a, a week or so ago, it, it changed my life. I want you to play it for me. crisis event happened to me in our previous facility on an Easter Sunday when I preached for the third time that day was bone tired, bone tired, poured out myself, the singer's choir had done a, a cantata and people had come to Christ and I prayed and I got through with the meeting. The other building had a, had a, a platform with no steps. So it was my habit to just sit it like this and let my feet dangle down on the edge of the platform. And I was like right just about the same angle with the middle aisle. And I'm just saying so tired. I remember taking my knot on my tie and loosening it and saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to chill. Carol was playing just like Jamal's playing now, exactly. People praying, workers, deacons helping. And I was tired. I want to go home. I hadn't eaten all day. And then I look, and around the one, two, three, four, fifth row, there's a guy in the aisle around level with the fifth row. He had a cap, filthy cap, but he had it in his hand. And he was staring at me and looking at me. And I could tell by his eyes, like, he wanted to know, could he come up here and talk to me? And I just looked at him a little closer. Man, the guy was disheveled, filthy looking, matted hair, a mess. He looked in his 50s. He, he actually was 31. And I just looked at him. And I thought he 
because Everton, Celia, they remember back in that building, a lot of people panhandling in the church. They would come in and ask for money, and we had procedures of what to do when people ask for money. So we don't want to fill their habit and hand them money. They'll just go out and drink it. And I thought to myself, what a bummer, because I'm going to have to give money. I'm not even going to go through the procedure. I'm going to just give this guy some money. I had no wallet then. I had a money clip. So I waved him up, and he came. So I'm here. He got to about five, six feet away from me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Smell? No, a smell? You think you've smelled something? I'll match that smell with anything you've ever smelled in your life. A mixture of feces, urine, sweat, street, and alcohol. Stir gently and let it cook for a while. And that's what I smell. Nasty. I looked away to, to inhale and I started questioning, what's your name, David? Okay, I'm a minister. Let me go through at least the procedures here. So, uh, man, you look bad. I didn't know he was laying in his own urine right outside the side door on Park Place uh, in that building. And he heard the music and it drew him in. He was just sprawled laying out there. So he's there. Oh, Lord. Where'd you sleep last night? Deserted truck. How come you're not in a shelter? Too dangerous. Almost got killed last one I was in. Okay. Man, this guy smells bad. Missing it. One or two teeth. At least one right in the front. Let, let me give him five dollars something. Not the way I wanted to end the day, but, you know, what can you do? Took out the money. I remember handing it. Pushed it down. Said, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus you were talking about. And at that moment, I forgot all about David because I knew who was really in need of prayer. It was Jim Cimbala. It wasn't David. So I forgot him. I lifted my hands, like I'm gonna ask you to do in a moment. And I just said, God, please forgive me. What have I become? What kind of cheap two-bit preacher have I become? You sent somebody who's searching for you. And I want to give him a few dollars and get rid of him. Please help me. And God, that moment baptized me with a love, with something, with grace. He saw how pitiful I was. And David knew it. And he drew close to me. And I started to cry. And he started to cry. And then he fell against me and he put his head over here. And I put my arms around him. And he put his arms around me. And for a while we just rocked back and forth. A preacher in need of God, a guy from the street in need of God. I'm not sure who was needier. Might have been me. You know what God spoke to me that moment? And this is not trendy at all. Those of you who want to go to like church growth institutes, this is not what this church is about. God spoke to me and said, you see that smell? If you don't love that smell, I can never use you. Because the whole world smells that way to me. All the stinking, filthy sin of mankind. I sent my son to die for that smell. So you're either going to embrace it 
and love people in my name or I can't use you, I'll put you on the shelf. And if God is my witness, you can believe it or not, suddenly that smell became like the most beautiful lady's perfume you ever smelled in your life. It was just overwhelming. He was weeping, I was weeping, I led him to Christ. We prayed, we detoxed him for four or five days. Hired him on church, staff, housekeeping. He spent Thanksgiving and Christmas at my house that year. My buddy got his teeth fixed, handsome guy. For that Christmas, all he had, he gave me a handkerchief. He wrapped it up in wrapping paper, gave me a white handkerchief. I kept it for years. It meant more to me than anything anyone could give me. You could have bought me a car. I would have said, keep your car, give me that handkerchief. And what broke him and what broke me is God's love. Brothers and sisters, let's walk in love this year. Let's think about other people. Let's love other people. If they're different than us, think different than us, look different than us, smell different than us. I didn't grow up around that smell. I was blessed, fortunate, middle class, Polish, Ukrainian, middle class home. I went, God, that's not, that wasn't my world. But it's God's world. And he wants to use all of us. Stand to our feet. We have eight minutes until 12.30, and I told you that's how long you would stay. I want everybody that would to come walk to this altar. And I want you to lift your hands, even as Jim Zimbala just talked about, and I want you to ask the Lord to baptize us in that kind of love. To baptize us with that kind of grace, that kind of mercy. With the smell of sin. is the smell of the signal of redemption. Somebody needs to be redeemed. I want you to ask the Lord to pour a spirit of love and generosity and mercy and grace in you. God, baptize Lake City PH Church in your love and in your grace and in your mercy that we would not withhold anything from you and that we would not see people the way we see people, but that we would see them like you see them, that we would see them in the redemptive need The fact that you shed your blood, you paid the ransom for them. They don't deserve your grace, but you deserve what you paid for. They don't deserve your love and your mercy, but you deserve what you purchased at Calvary. Let the spirit of conviction rest over us. Let the spirit of conviction rest over us. Baptize us in your love. Baptize us in your love. Baptize us. If you don't love that smell, I can't use you. The only 
true thing I've ever wanted in my life. God is for you to use me. Oh, there's been other secondary things. There's been cars I would have liked to have had and houses and land I would have liked to have owned. But God, really, when it boils down to it, the only real thing I've ever really wanted, the thing that I would trade everything else for, is for you to use me. I want to be used of you. I want to be used by you, God. I want to be used by you. And I want this church to be used by you, God. We're at a crossing point, Lord. This is no longer a middle-class white church. This is no longer a middle-class church. This is no longer a, a church that's socially um, in, a, in a what? God, this is the church. This is the body of Christ. This is a church that will reach the rich, the poor, the destitute, the downtrodden, the millionaire, the billionaire. God, this is a church that will reach all people. But Lord, we've got to love people. We've got to love that smell. We've got to love that smell because it is the signaling of redemption. That person needs to be redeemed. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God. I hope you know that I did not preach to excite you this morning. I did not preach to entertain you this morning. I did not even preach to educate you this morning. I just pray that the Spirit of God is convicting all of us. Starting with me. God convict all of us any attitude of arrogance or elitism. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Because what you do to the least, to the least of these, you have done unto me. The least worthy. The least holy. The least least you have done to me.
God, fill this church with people. Undesirable people. Poor people. Fill this church with people. Hurting people. Broken people. Dejected, rejected. Disgraced. That we may tell them of this Jesus and introduce them to his blessings and to his goodness and to his love and to his mercy and to his redemptive power. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I don't know that we've ever had a service quite like this one. I don't know that I've ever sensed a presence or a spirit hovering over us quite like the one that is right now. But I believe God has addressed us personally this morning. And I believe we are going to be obedient to what he has spoken to us. Both as a church and as a people. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a good hand clap of praise this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Sister Irene, it's so good to see you at the house of the Lord this morning. She's been out for a number of months, and thank God she's back in the house of God this morning. God bless you. We love you. You are dismissed. Be back tonight at 6 o'clock. Don't forget the shower tonight. <laughs>